so we're going to bring the meeting to order. It is 7.02. Um, so welcome everybody to the Town of Williston's Development Review Board for June 11th. Um, again, we are going to bring the meeting to order. We've got two items on the agenda for tonight. Uh, we are going to, uh, we always do start off with a public forum if anybody wants to um, bring anything to the attention of the board prior to the actual uh, items on the agenda being heard. Anybody here? Anybody want to bring anything? Say anything? Tell a joke? No. Okay. Um, so first up is HP 19-03 and uh, AP 19-0214. Andrew and Angela Conforti. You're Angela. Yeah. Come on up and have a seat at the front desk. All right. <coughs> bring your kids too if you want. Okay, they're good. <laughs> <laughs> It might be exciting. We haven't had kids sitting there. So. Um, so we always do start these things off uh, by having you uh, state your name and your address, please. Sure. Angela Conforti, 23 Old Stage Road, Williston, Vermont, 05495. And the kids' names are? Green Navy Ruby. Perfect. Good. Welcome, guys. Come on, look up from your PDAs for one second. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same thing my kids do. Um, who's up? Emily. That's me. All right. This is a request for a certificate of appropriateness to convert a door to a window at 23 Old Stage Road. The subject property is within the additional review area of the Village Zoning District and thus requires a certificate of appropriateness to be issued by the DRB with advice from the HAC, the Historic and Architectural Advisory Committee. Project History. The brick Greek Revival House, circa 1842, has seen many changes over the years. See attached photos at the end of the packet. The summer kitchen was replaced in the 1980s with the wood-sided addition on the northern rear end of the home. This addition created a new side door to the right of the original side door. A three-season porch used to be located on the east facade and was removed prior to the 1980s addition. The applicant is converting the door to a window as part of an interior kitchen renovation. Hack review. This project was reviewed by the hack three times. The original proposal removed the side lights and replaced the door with a dual crank casement window. The applicant revised their project proposal to bring it in compliance with the bylaw requirements and hack recommendations by retaining side, the side lights and using a double hung window. Recommended action. Staff recommends that the DRB issue a certificate for the project as recommended by the HAC at their meeting of June 4th, 2019. The certificate attached only includes the last recommendation about color as a condition because the applicant's proposal already meets all the other recommendations um, that are listed in the table below. The DRB may decide to add or modify the certificate's conditions. So what follows is a table. The left column has the hack recommendations by date and then how the applicant responded in their revised proposal, pro providing some additional detail. Um, the color options have printed out in black and white. Um, the darker color looks black, but it's a dark purple. Um, and the exterior color is a, a yellow beige trim. So there are three color options. Hack preferring color option one that'll match the existing side door. Um, the first photo, photo in your packet shows the two stores side by side and then you can see um, color option one the next page over for comparison. Um, I will note that the side lights are changing in size. They're going to be a little bit shorter to accommodate the interior kitchen counter. Um, but the side lights will line up with the double hung window. Uh, the east facade of the house has double hung windows, so it'll be matching with the six over six pattern. Um, and the ap applicant will be retaining as much of that original millwork um, as possible. Uh, that can be seen in their, um, their proposed rendering. Thank you. Okay, that's it? Yeah, if you have any questions, we can go into more detail. So I have one major question. What color option do you like? Uh, oh, come on, you must have a preference. Originally, um, because it's all trim work below, 
I was leaning towards the tannish color. That would be number two. Um, That's two? I don't have that with. So number one is the full purple. Number two is tan with purple trim below. Okay, so number three. So number three is the full tan. But um, but I have to say after I like did a little um, fake photoshopping, <laughs> which I had to take care of myself, um, I agreed with the hacks recommendation on the dark purple. Um, You're not just saying that, just to make the hack the hack. No, happy. I think no, I. <laughs> Better. <laughs> so that that would, that would be option one. Yeah, I think either either option one or number option number three um, would appease the both of us. Um, I am struggling to see the difference in these. Is there a photo, uh, is there a color photo anywhere? Um, so what, is the purple, what is the purple paint cost versus the tan paint? They're both in the basement. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it depend, you know, depending on how long they've been down there. Uh, right, no. I they, mean, may not, a, they may not be down there. I mean, I have photo. to say I'm not crazy about the, the yellow tan this on the house the anyway, door. so. What, what I'm asking is, what I'm asking is, is, are you going to use a purple paint anywhere else in the house other than this oh, this little window, exercise? It's on the exter all, it's on all three exterior doors. Okay, that's all. Um, so it's whatever, whatever you want to do. They're not making Thanks. So yeah, they're converting it to a window. Go to the website. The pack is uploaded on there, and it has the color photos. I think Matt's pulling it up on the iPad, yeah. so we can pass it. Why are we talking about the color of the door if what they're doing is converting a window? Angela, are you going to paint? Are you going to paint both doors the same or colors? Okay. We that had no. You're we had no you? intention of painting the one on the right would a different look, color. Look kind of, we, one of the things that I hate about this board is what's going on right now, and that mm -hmm. is this board weighing in on your color choices. <laughs> right? It drives this drives me crazy when a <laughs> hack does this. So I'm happy to go on record for the for this. Um, uh, yes, it would be nice if it be it would be um, uh, historically correct, and that's why they're doing it. But it's your house. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's not a door, but it also like we want to um, make sure that the integrity of the home is there by keeping the trim, and that was in our original proposal. Um, I don't think it's going to look like a door because it's a window um, and I know that the hacks recommendation by painting it the purple color is to make it appear as though it is the original door still sure, sure. Um, someone tries to walk through it <laughs> staff's recommendation at the hack meeting last week was that either color option based on the bylaw would work that's a level of specificity that we don't quite have to go to. So you could recommend option number one, you could strike that recommendation, and then they can pick one, two, or three based off of their preference. Okay. Either I like, option I like being that one, you strike it and let them do whatever they want. So it will appear like a door still, but be a window? Correct. Did you explore the option of just converting it to a window? and? So original, the original thought was uh, to maximize the light coming in, that we would use a large window. And we had a, um, a double casement window that we proposed to the hack. Um, the original thought was to have a mason come in and do brick and just brick in the rest of the opening. I mean, I can certainly understand why the hack shot, shot that down. Well, that was never but I actually, never even actually proposed it. Oh, is that right? It. Never, um, they never did And then it. I spoke with an architect who we've used um, previously um, in New Jersey, and she said going into it that the hack is going to want to see as much original trim um, as possible, and it would probably be um, a nicer looking. Um, finalized product without more mason work 
as you can see, well, maybe you can't see in the photos, a lot of work has already been done on the house um, with bricks and patchwork. Um, so that's why we revised, our original proposal, right, was it, um, to get rid of the side lights, but to keep the um, mill work on the sides and to maximize the lighting with a double casement window. Um, And the hacks recommendation was not to use a double casement window because there wasn't one right. on the other as, um, on the rest of the house and they wanted it to to <coughs> it to remain um, as close looking to a door as possible Questions from the board? Are you, uh, are you fine if the board gives you the choice, kicks the choice right back to you and lets you decide what you want to do? Happy okay. <laughs> Pete? Uh, I have no further questions. Bill, you all set? Uh. Dave? All set? All? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because it's okay. It's, we're going to close. Uh, we're going to close HP nineteen zero three HP nineteen zero two one four for Andrew and Angela and forty at seven fourteen. Okay. Uh, next up, DP 19-09, Gary Howard. Come on up. Gary Howard, 697 Butternut Road, Williston, Vermont, 05495. Sue Smart Howard, 697 Butternut Road, Williston, Vermont, 05495. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Matt. I'll take this. Um, this uh, staff report was prepared by Melinda Scott, who unfortunately can't be here tonight. She's attending to a family emergency. So forgive me if I stumble over words I didn't write. And uh, please feel free to stop me at any point as it's a little bit lengthy um, in terms of just going over all the elements of a rural subdivision as we do. That said, this is a request for discretionary permit review of a proposed five lot residential subdivision of 121.79 acre parcel. The parcel is located at 700 Butternut Road and the outline of it is shown in the center of your overview map on the staff report. The applicant's proposing to divide that single lot into four lots sized from three to 12.32 acres, as well as an open space lot um, Lots one and two will be 12.32 and 12 acres respectively, proposed for residential development at this time. Lot three is the open space lot and will consist of 91.35 acres of open space permanently protected by designation. A lot three, uh, sorry, lots four and five are proposed at 3.06 acres each and are not proposed for development at this time, but would be reserved for future development. In other words, they're not part of the open space, uh, but also their complete design necessary to approve development is not being reviewed under the action of the DRE that would have to happen subsequent discretionary permit. Uh, this parcel currently has no dwelling units on it, so one dwelling unit is allowed by right, and the proposed residential development will add a total of three additional units to the site for a uh, total of four. And one dwelling unit in Williston is defined as any unit containing two or more bedrooms. A uh, unit with one bedroom or studio is half a dwelling unit. In this case, each of the four dwelling units proposed is a whole dwelling unit, two bedrooms or more. Um, the subject parcel that is south of Butternut Road has existed since before 1990, which means it's existed in its current state since before Williston ever did growth management. Uh, there was a boundary line adjustment that altered its boundaries slightly, um, or significantly actually, um, 
but that boundary line adjustment was primarily related to the treatment of the parcel as a split parcel. In other words, uh, there was one piece of land, Butternut Road ran through it, and the Williston Development Bylaw allows the town to treat that as two separate pieces of land uh, due to the, the way the road divides them physically and um, divides their ability to be used together. So the DRB for this project reviewed a pre-application um, for, sorry, not for this project. They reviewed a pre-application uh, in 2013 and discretionary permit and then they reviewed a discretionary permit for a boundary line adjustment in April of 2018, which resulted in the boundaries of the parcel now proposed for subdivision. To be clear, boundary line adjustment is something where you change the boundaries of the parcel, but you do not create any new parcels or new rights to build. This project was previously reviewed on December 11th, 2018 as a pre-application. The board made recommendations at the pre-application hearing that the applicant has responded to, including the requirement for the applicant to provide a habitat disturbance assessment, which has been included with your staff report. Um, the requirement that the open space be shown as a separate platted lot, and that has been done and is reflected on the plan. Um, the requirement for a draft trail easement, because the applicant was proposing, is proposing uh, a public trail across the property. That draft easement has been submitted. There was a question the board had about the nature and extent of any wetlands on the site, uh, and there's been a memo submitted stating there are no wetlands on lots one or two, which are the lots proposed for residential development at this time. Um, the DRB also asked for a professionally controlled runoff and erosion control plan. The applicant has not submitted that plan and requests that this requirement be postponed until administrative permit applications are submitted. So uh, I'll say a little bit about that, which is when I review projects administratively, if the amount of land disturbance crosses a certain threshold, typically over a quarter acre, I am um, cued or triggered by the bylaw to require some kind of runoff and erosion control plan. So um, there's, there's sort of a natural catch in there, but it's up to the DRB to decide about moving forward without that plan as part of discretionary permit tonight, um, deferring it to administrative permit, or a third choice would be to possibly defer it until final plans, but not all the way until the administrative permit comes in the door. That said, as the administrator, if the bylaw requires me to get a runoff and erosion control plan before I sign a permit, I don't sign the permit unless I get it. That's um, the, way I, the way I do things down at the planning office. Um, the applicant was also requested to meet with Public Works and Fire to clarify any potential requirements and has done that. So the updated plans are reflective of those conversations and have been reviewed by those departments and those departments have provided comments. Um, the other part was to, at pre-application, it was recommended the applicant meet with the planning staff to go over the growth management scoring criteria. So you may remember, at pre-application, the DRB makes a bunch of recommendations and the motion is to move forward to an intermediate step called growth management, which we did uh, back in the second meeting in March. So, the applicant did go through growth management and received an award of four dwelling units of growth management allocation on March 27th, 2018. And there were some representations about the project made by the applicant as part of their growth management survey. Those recommendations are binding because the award of allocation is based on fulfilling those promises. So um, energy efficiency was not mentioned in the application, but was pledged at the growth management hearing. That generally plays out as a condition I need to enforce when I review any proposed permits for houses. Uh, there was no affordable housing pledged, um, and that remains true. There was an offer of a trail easement dedication, and the applicant has included that draft trail easement. Uh, under design for context, the applicant represented they were proposing low-density rural housing, and it's staff's opinion that that remains the case. Under open space, there were no points awarded because there's no third party dedication of the open space. In other words, the reason the open space will be protected or the mechanism by which it will be protected is merely zoning enforcement, but not ownership of any property rights by any third party. 
And finally, uh, the score for minimizing visual impact was based on a finding that the houses proposed would be partially screened by vegetation and terrain. So not completely invisible from the public right of way, um, Butternut Road, but partially screened. So the proposed use for this project is to add today two new dwelling units to the parcel. Single and two family dwelling units are an allowed use in the agricultural rural residential zoning district, which is where we're located. In terms of potential residential density on this parcel in the agricultural rural residential zoning district, the maximum allowed density is one dwelling unit per 80,000 square feet, which is a little less than two acres. And you do have to take out your steep slopes, wetlands, uh, wetland protection buffers, and uh, watershed protection buffers around rivers, leaving you only with the uh, essentially developable land to calculate your density. There's a table in the staff report reflecting that calculation. And based on that calculation, the maximum number of allowed dwelling units on this parcel would be 39. Um, and again, the applicant's proposing four. Um, there's an explanation of that calculation below the table. In this zoning district, you can have a minimum lot size smaller than 80,000 square feet, and at low, you can have a lot as small as 15,000 square feet, which is a little over a third of an acre. Uh, in this case, the lot sizes for dwelling units range from 3 to 12.32 acres. Those are all allowable lot sizes for dwelling in Williston. In terms of setbacks and landscaping, the overall subject parcel is, is subject to landscaping and buffering requirements of Chapter 23. However, um, it's not quite as specifically specified as it is if we were reviewing the commercial development in corners. So in Ag Rural Zoning District, Chapter 23 says developments, quote, must provide ample buffers, unquote, um, not specifying the widths. Typically, in this district, those buffers take the shape of the uh, leaving of existing wooded vegetation, basically um, not clearing right up to property lines. And the description in the staff report of what the town means when it says type one buffer leaving existing vegetation. Um, there isn't a specific call out in the plan set or application discussing landscape buffers. Uh, there has been some logging on the site, and um, the building envelope for lot one is about 150 to 200 feet from an existing home on an adjacent lot. Uh, considering that context, if the DRB wishes to require some enhancement of the landscape buffer to ensure that uh, development that happens on that proposed lot conforms to the 50 feet of existing vegetation or functionally conforms to that, the DRB could consider requiring uh, some additional plantings to make that happen. As I mentioned, there is uh, open space set aside in a separately platted lot for this project. It's 91.35 acres, and the way that it will be kept as open space is via the zoning enforcement process. In other words, if, if somebody were to ever want to put a structure on that or go ahead and do that, it would be a zoning violation enforced the same way the rest of the zoning bylaws enforce. But that land does not have to be in public ownership, does not have to have an easement over it owned by Vermont Land Trust or anybody else. Um, it's merely protected by the town having it on the map and keeping eyes on it the same way we keep an eye on zoning compliance for anything else in town. Um, the proposed open space does contain an existing accessory structure that the staff presumes uh, was used in support of agriculture. Agriculture is an allowed use of open space, and the staff has generally reviewed um, proposed structures in open space that support agriculture on a case-by-case -case basis. Where there's one existing, staff would represent that um, it's acceptable to allow it to remain. The uses of that structure would be limited to agricultural uses that are called for in protected open space. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, there's no wetlands identified on the site plan. Uh, state wetland ecologist Alan Quackenbush did visit the site in April of 2019 and submitted a memo, which you should have attached, uh, stating that there's no wetlands on lot one or lot, lot two. 
There are some other constrained areas uh, noted on the state maps. Uh, there are some class two wetlands on the subject parcel as well as an unnamed stream tributary and some steep slopes on lot four, which is not proposed for development at this time. There's also significant wildlife habitat area, which triggers the requirement that the applicant submit the habitat disturbance assessment, which you should have attached to your report. Um, if this discretionary permit is approved, which keep in mind is for development of two of the four potential residential lots, future development of lot four and or lot five, the other two, uh, will require a separate application to amend this discretionary permit. So developing those lots uh, not be an administrative matter, it would come back to the DRB. And at that time, staff would recommend a full assessment of impacts to wetlands, waterways, and on the other conservation areas on those lots. So we're trying to be very clear that the town's requirement to plat open space as a separate lot has generated um, a demand for applicants to plat other lots that they don't necessarily want to develop right away. And the way to kind of balance that is to know that those lots are going to be developed, but not do full discretionary permit review on them. Make sure everybody's aware of that, that um, you know, you, you could plat that lot today. We're not reviewing it for development potential. It could be wet now. It could get wetter in the future. The rules could change in the future. There are no guarantees around that other than it's not part of the open space. Okay. The down um, does have some requirements related to access. Access to lots one and two are proposed via shared driveway from Butternut Road. Access to lot four will be via a 60 foot wide access easement over an abutting parcel. And access to lot five will be via a 65 foot wide easement over lots one, two, and three. In uh, Williston, our bylaw allows up to five dwellings on a shared driveway. Uh, there are some additional standards for driveways that serve more than one dwelling, including the requirement for the grade of those driveways not to exceed 10%. Uh, there are also some additional standards outside of the zoning bylaw that probably to pay attention to that come from the Department of Public Works. Um, that new access driveway from Butternut Road will require an access permit from the Department of Public Works. And when Public Works is permitting a new access or curb cut to a town road, they're basically looking at things like culvert sizing, line of sight, um, adequate turn radius, and design standards like that. Our bylaw in this zoning district also does require that any parcels that are created have a minimum of 40 feet of frontage on a public or private road or drive for all new lots. The proposed lot configuration appears to meet this requirement. Um, so not all lots in this district have to have frontage on a road. They can have frontage on an, essentially an easement with a driveway in it. Um, so you don't have to create those sort of little flagpoles for lots in this district. You do have to provide frontage on an access. Um, staff is noting again for emphasis, the access to lot four is problematic because there's a steep ravine and tributary to cross to get there. And again, reminding everybody that full review of development of that lot is, is not under consideration tonight and there's no guarantees. Uh, there may be some challenges or adjustments that need to be made uh, if that lot were to be developed. In terms of traffic, the DRB did not require a traffic study uh, as part of pre-application. In Williston, we generally assume that two additional single family dwelling units are going to produce 2.02 .02 p.m. peak hour trip and so uh, one vehicle in or, or, or uh, out times 2.02 .02 during the busiest hour between 4 and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. Stormwater. Um, the proposed development's not anticipated to disturb any land within any of the watershed protection buffers. There are steep slopes on the parcel, particularly in the area proposed for an access driveway. This does kick the project into our high-risk development category. And that's why we have the requirement for the runoff and erosion control plan showing compliance with the performance standards of our bylaw as it relates to watershed protection. Um, and this is the one, as I mentioned, the applicants requested to defer the submission of that plan until the time an administrative permit to build a house comes in, um, understanding that when somebody is 
getting a permit to build a house, they're investing in lots of planning and design and all of those things, um, and that those plans do come with a uh, significant expense. In terms of water and wastewater, the applicant's proposing on-site water supply and on-site wastewater systems or septic systems, and the applicant has obtained a state water and wastewater permit and shown the location of those systems and wells for the proposed lots one and two. And again, uh, on the other two potential house lots, the applicant is deferring any design of those systems and understands that that would have to be reviewed under the standards at the time it comes in. In terms of public comment and town departments and boards, uh, we did receive a written comment from Kevin Mazuzan dated May 29, 2019. That's in your packet. We received review of this project by the Police, Fire, and Public Works Departments as well as the Conservation Commission. The Fire Department did not make any comments on the project at this time. Um, they did s sort of reserve the right to comment as development moves forward if there's future construction. Um, Department of Public Works noted the requirement for a right-of-way permit or what we call an access permit in the staff report and did request a pre-construction meeting when the administrative permit happens. And typically, that's to assess erosion control and any potential impacts to the town road. The Conservation Commission also made recommendations. Um, they made a recommendation related to working with the Conservation Commission to determine an acceptable alignment for the primitive trail easement um, with consideration of best management practices for deer wintering areas, which means generally trying to avoid them when you develop a trail. Um, the Conservation Commission recommended a condition that future houses be sited to the degree feasible so as to maintain connectivity of the wildlife corridor and deer wintering area. Um, locate the building envelope on lot one as far west as possible to maximize the connectivity of the forested habitat. So when we're talking about deer wintering area, we're talking about the most densely forested stuff where deer are able to forage even from heavy snow and find shelter from that weather. Deer tend to like contiguous blocks of that heavy forest, both to stay in and, and to move through. Um, Conservation Commission recommended that the administrative permit application for the development of any lot be accompanied by a runoff and erosion control plan. So we're, we're back to that again, emphasizing that. Um, and again, understanding that any future development of lot four or five shall constitute an amendment to the proposed subdivision and will require an application for a discretionary permit, which shall be reviewed by the Conservation Commission prior to DRB review. So full discretionary permit process for that further development. Based on all of that, um, the staff is recommending approval of this discretionary permit and has provided draft findings of fact, conclusions of law, and recommended conditions of approval for the property. Um, I'll call out a couple of recommended conditions of approval. One is to take the Conservation Commission, Public Works, and Fire Department comments and adopt them as conditions of approval. Um, and then we have a lot of our standard conditions. However, we are calling out in condition 15, any future development of lot four or lot five will require discretionary permit and DRB approval. Um, and that is it. So thinking back, uh, there was some discussion of whether any additional landscape buffering might be needed. There's not a draft condition about landscape buffering in here now. If the DRB wishes to add one, they would need to draft it um, in this discussion of the regulation. I will stop there. Thank you, Matt. That was a uh, comprehensive review. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Howard, what would you like to add to that? <laughs> no, not much. I, it, 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 yeah, <laughs> we covered, he covered it pretty well. We've been over it enough times so that I don't think there's anything else to add. I understand the details about lots four and five. They were beyond my ken when I started this project. They're there because of the open land, land that I had left over, and they advised me to make them into lots um, at this particular point. So I understand about the Development Review Board of those. Um, the, the only thing, the, the water management part, um, 
when the people that are buying the land design their driveway, I understand completely when that is. That's why I'm asking to have that. You're talking about the erosion control plan. Right. Have that be deferred until somebody comes up with an actual driveway site house plan. Um, at this point, I don't know those details. Okay. All right. Anything else? We have questions from the board. I just got one question. When you, when you keep talking about you know the uh, barriers to line of sight, where where's where's Kevin's house in relative to these uh, lots one and two? It's you know, west of the actual how, the actual building sites. Are it's they west. All, are they already basically isolated with, along the lot line with the trees and everything already? There's lots of trees. It'll be hard to see anything. Okay. That's all I was curious. They're far enough. <coughs> well, it's well treed and brushed. <laughs> are there building en envelopes designated on the subdivision plot? Yes. And so is it the square with? Yes. Because I noticed in the impact, um, in the assessment that was done, um, the habitat assessment or inventory that was done, they um, made some recommendations. It said keep housing on lots two and three on the eastern side as much as possible. Well, my, my as far west as possible. Um, as far down the hill as possible so the open space will be across the top on the, on the excuse me, Yes, as far west as possible, so the open space will be on the eastern edge. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading right directly from okay. the habitat inventory under impact assessment and recommendations. It says, if the land is subdivided, impact can be minimized by keeping housing on lots two and three on the eastern side as much as possible. And that says, or better in the case of lot three in the field in the northwest corner. Um, I think lot three isn't slated for development, correct? No. So that's kind of moot. Um, and then it talks again more about development on lot three being outside of the deer wintering area. Um, but I think what's relevant to me anyway is the discussion of the lot two and where the housing should be. Um, on lot two, at least for, per their recommendations. So that's not the same as what you understand? Because it looks like it's the building envelope isn't on the eastern um, side of that lot. It's kind of right in the middle. Is Kevin? Hi, I'm Kevin Mazuzan, 1120 Butternut Road. Am I talking out of turn? I can shed some light on this discussion. Uh, Kevin, just hang one second. Okay. If, I will get to you. Yep. Housing on lots two and three. three. Yeah. On the eastern side as much. Well, that's that, down here. You'd be in this. This is sort of the middle of that lot, and this is as close to the. Kind of, well, this is lot one, so yeah, that that's not this, relevant. I think it's just this lot and, that and they're talking yeah. about. And I don't know based on the topo topography or the what's on the land here right. whether or not this is as east as it can go. Maybe Kevin can shed some light on this, but that's. It can go further east if it comes back up here on the driveway. The one that puts it down there is to keep it out of the, the driveway access. There's a driveway access that comes right down here. So, so this lot could go further east? It could. That was where it was sited. There's been no, you know, the... Would is, this, is, this, this, is this the deer? Yeah. They actually cross in here, right? They cross it. Yeah, that in that area going up the whole slope, you yeah. know, right? So, so keeping the property, keeping the building envelope as, as far up as you can over here yeah. as you can. We we'll keep you a corridor there. There's a driveway right there. There's this right of way that would give them a little bit of space from that. Yeah, you can put it anywhere you want. Okay. Um, so this, it does seem like a good time, Kevin. You want to you want to shed your your you know some light on the siting, sure. the siting no, of not so much about the siting. Um, I mean, I, so let me let me please let me interrupt you one second and say that you know we do I do have your yeah. your letter and I and I at some point tonight I was going to ask you to run through it yeah 
Um, uh, so let's just keep it more to this topic yes. until we get yep. to this. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, so Kevin Mazuz on 1120 Watermelon Road at the Conservation Commission meeting, this Jill came up. There was a question, and Melinda was going to reach back to Quackenbush and find out for some clarification on which direction because the commission was very concerned. This is reflected in the notes. They were concerned about what direction. Uh, so it was, it was a, a, a ongoing conversation at the commission meeting. Uh, I don't know if there was any um, clarification. I can share that um, the commission then came up with a recommendation based on what they thought Quackenbush meant. And then when, when actually Jesse read it, he said he had the same question that the, the uh, Commission had as well, so it just was a little wonky, and there needed to be some clarification. And I don't know if that clarification came through. I'm assuming it did. It was not reflective in the minutes, uh, but I'm assuming that, that that clarification came through, and the recommendation went forward. Do we have a specific recommendation from the commission with respect to that item? That's the one moving it as far east as possible. Right. Okay, so that's, well, that's the, that's the recommendation of... Excuse me, west. West. As far west as possible. Yeah, they put Again, the east it says up. keeping yeah. housing and it should on, be east on because the eastern side. Part of the reason for the land being purchased is the view. And the view is from up the hill. You move it west down the hill and you've reduced its value. The east top of that property is where you can see the Adirondacks from. And if you move it, the farther you move it down the hill, the more you restrict the buyer's value. So, and I can't, I don't know any reason of, I, I can't imagine moving it further west. west, because that would be even that would make a wider spread. Then we'd have Kevin's house and another house. You'd have you're building a wall there. You move it east and west. You leave it up the top of the hill where it is. Move it west and it moves it away from Kevin's house. Right, and it moves it down the hill. Down the hill. It moves it out of the value of the property. So again, what I was reading was Mr. Quackenbush's recommendation, and I guess I what I'm trying to find out is did the planning was it the um, conservation. conservation commission did they make a specific recommendation east or west as to east or west See, they made the recommendation on where they say locate the envelope on lot one as far west as possible maximize connectivity of forest and habitat so that wasn't a wetland Recommendation. Yeah, Quackenbush isn't the one. That's Tina's, uh, I forget right now her last name, but Tina's the land, the wildlife management. Uh, no, she's a wetlands person. Oh. Quackenbush was wetlands. Yeah. Tina, I forget. It's probably in the other folder. Sharp? Sharp. Tina Sharp. Sharf, that's it. Was the I know, yeah, A R F. I knew it had a weird, I couldn't bring it into any focus. Sharp. Do we have a clarification on whether the recommendation was to move the houses east or west? Or both? Okay, so the summary in the staff report said locate the building envelope on lot one as far west as possible. Okay. The, I'm looking for the actual. Conservation Commission. What the impact assessment stated, this is what was 
prepared by Tina Scharf said this property is wooded, which makes it part of core habitat. Given its position, it also serves as a wildlife corridor. If the land is subdivided, impact would be minimized by keeping housing on lots two and three on the eastern side as much as possible. Um, That's what he's reading. This. And on the eastern side, which is back up the hill. The so lots two and three. Right. We're not. We're not. No proposal to build anything on lot three. No. But lot two, the house, the house could. It's currently centered in the middle of the lot. In the middle of the proposed lot, would could be moved. Could be moved according to that to the east. It could be moved to the east. Okay. No, nothing about lot one. At least not not in uh, the paragraph I just pulled from the wildlife impact assessment. You'll, you'll recall that as Wait it relates to wetlands, what Alan Quackenbush did was look at both lots one and two because those are the ones proposed for development under this application and said there are no wetlands on either of these lots. Mm -hmm. So any, any adjustment to envelopes at this point would be about something other than wetlands, whether it was wildlife habitat or uh, view shed, et cetera. I thought the rock outcrop was on lot one, not on lot two. This, this area. I, what outcrop, sir? She, she says the author found one rock outcrop on lot two. And for some reason, I thought when you were talking about the original lot one, why it was designed the way it was, was because there was a rock no, outcrop. No, I, I, I think what she's just referring to as ledge. You know, just ledge, je okay. ledge. I come, that whole that whole thing is ledge. I mean, <laughs> it's it's right. ledge. Um, you go up farther up the top of the hill, and it's bare ledge. And as it works down there, the trees have rotted and covered it and filled it in. But it's it's pretty much That's not small. That's not small. ledge. So they're not going they're not going to dig right. basements That's easily. <laughs> They'll go through a few teeth on their backhoes. I promise you that. Okay. All right. So I think we kind of hammered we hammered out or under, at least. I understand the, the sighting of lot two, nothing on lot three. Anybody on the, anybody here right on the board have any questions about that at the moment? I, um, I guess I feel like we discussed it, but I still don't feel like there's a resolution. Once no, I don't think there's okay. a, no, okay. I don't. I wasn't sure if you had found a resolution. No, 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 okay. I don't have a, uh, I don't have, no, I haven't come up with a resolution. Okay. I don't, I haven't proposed or, uh, anything. I just think we've discussed it, and I think the board can talk about what maybe the resolution would be Perfect. in deliberation. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, other questions from the board, either specifically or in general? Well, I was going to let it, um, Kevin Mazuzan have the floor. Okay, Kevin. Hi, Kevin Mazuzan, Road. Uh, Paul, you had a question about where my house is. Yeah, my house is about 150 to 200 feet away from the proposed building site of lot one. So, Kevin, just for just to measure that, Kevin, is that in the same direction as your boundary line, which extends your lawn out onto lot one? Did you use the same tools to measure how far your house is? Hey, Gary. Hey, hey, Gary. Yeah. Hang on a second. Sorry, okay. I'm sorry. So, you, so you're so you're further into the you're further into the box of that lot. I'm in the corner. Okay, how about Kevin? Why don't you come on up and locate your house on each of us? It's it's if you look here, you can see it really good. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're you're in the one. Come on up and just. Dave, um, Dave pulled out the photo, which you've got. Uh, so out. you're so you're right. You're in this corner, right? right here. Yes, sir. Right there. That's why I figured. Okay. okay. So right around here. Are you right in here? Yes, sir. That's all right. That's okay, so you're the guy then to answer the question about whether or not you need uh, a, bu a buffer. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Right. I am the guy. Okay. The floor is still yours. Uh, so one of the things, though, uh, Matt, when you were going through the staff report, could you, could you go back on page five, paragraph four? Yeah, I do. I, I wanted to bring that up. I, I, I missed that paragraph, and I can review that for the board um, because I think you'll find this is uh, a point of discussion uh, both for the board and, and the abutters. So there is 
adjacent to the subject parcel, there are other parcels of land not part of this proposal that have protected open space on them. And there, there are two parcels. If you were to look on the right side of the plaid, it's, it's Bruce and Isham Family Farm. So these are lands that have been protected under a combination of conservation easement or, or designation under um, prior actions with the town. And we have a standard in our bylaw in chapter 31, 31.7, that says when the DRB is reviewing development that will be open space development like the Howard Project, we want open space to line up or be contiguous to other protected open space. Because you know, open space is better when there's more of it consolidated and that that's part of the consideration of the board. So this is chapter 31, 31, seven. And what we say, must the protected open space be contiguous? Yes, the protected open space must be contiguous except as provided here. So yes, but. Um, it must also be contiguous with any open space on adjoining lots or parcels that is currently protected or is identified for protection of the town plan. So the first question is, must it be contiguous within the subject parcel? You, you have to put one chunk of open space on the table that's yours to control. The second part is, does it have to, does it have to be contiguous to other adjacent open space? And the answer is um, yes, and then the DRB may allow exceptions where either a small area that is isolated from the rest of the open space on the site is within a watershed protection buffer or the only home sites that comply with the standard of this chapter are adjacent to protected open space on an adjoining lot or parcel. How is contiguity defined? Contiguous open space is generally defined as an area of forest and or other natural community that is unfragmented by development remains in a natural state. In establishing standards for contiguity, the Conservation Commission and DRB will consider the context of the proposed development, including the type and relative value of resources as identified in chapters 27, 28, and 29 to, protected, to be protected and the configuration of open space that will best ensure the protection of those resources. So, Michael Bruce's land is conserved. It cannot be developed um, it is agricultural land. Michael Bruce's land is not contiguous to the proposed open space in the Howard subdivision. It is contiguous to proposed lot one, which is proposed for development. Um, it's, it's contiguous to the part of lot one that is not proposed to have a house on it, but lot one is not part of the protected open space, which is the standard for 31.7. The open space lot in Howard is contiguous to the Isham family farm parcel, which is also conserved. And so the, the way for the board, I think, to navigate this is using that language of the bylaw has the requirement for contiguity as it's stated in 31.7 been met by what is proposed in the Howard subdivision. And Heinz and Livingston is not conserved. Correct. Can you tell me, uh, is all of Michael Bruce's lot conserved? So everything that, that we can visually see from this? Everything, everything you can see on this plat that's Bruce's is conserved. So there's about 100, it might only be 90 acres on that side. It's the corner of Oak Hill Road and, and Butternut Road. Um, there was a 12 acre in holding subdivided out of it where there's a house today. The rest of it is conserved. Um, there's other Bruce lands across Oak Hill Road that are also conserved. Um, and is that also true of the Isham family farm protected lands? Uh, everything you can see here it, on this plat is conserved land for Isham family farm. And it, it's, you know, the parcel goes all the way down to Oak Hill Road, covers the um, sugar house and everything. You've got the Heinz sitting right between both parcels blocking it. The Heinz parcels in between, that's the former Senna farm that has not come in for any kind of protection. I think there's a house farther back too. There is, it's, it's uh, actually it's about here. Mm -hmm. There's a meadow 
back in here with nothing in it yet. Kevin, go ahead. So the Isham family farm and the Bruce farm are farms of local importance, so they're in the conservation under that criteria. They're also in uh, the conservation area because of the criteria of core habitat, as well as wildlife corridor. So if you go back to the town of Williston, uh, chapter 13 plan, it talks about maintaining forest land, maintaining contiguity, not fragmenting forest. Okay, so I, I, Kevin, I want to make, I do want to make a point of clarification. And, I, and, I, and my point of clarification goes back to something you just said. Yeah. And that is that why the Isham family farms and the Bruce farms have, um, have been conserved. And the reason they have been conserved is because those two families came and wanted something from the town to do something with their property. So let's just be clear that if they hadn't come before the board to request something, some use of their property, they wouldn't be conserved, most likely. I mean, they could have gone to they could have gone to, you know, the, one of the conservation groups and, and sold off the development rights, and it would not have occurred in front of this board. But chances are, I guess Matt, you could you could probably agree with or confirm this that both of them came before the board. They wished to do something. I know Bruce did because it wasn't that long ago, um, and uh, so they did get something. They did get something um, from the town uh, in order to develop their property and in turn protected their open space. Go ahead. Understood. Okay. They could have come and developed and it would have had to go before a wildlife disturbance assessment and it would have been identified as uh, corridor and uh, habitat. So it would have. So, I, then, like I said, I, need, I needed to make sure that I made my point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but my point is that there's, there's criteria that it, that, it, that it meets, and Matt was describing Chapter 31, but if you dive real deep into Chapter 27, Conservation Areas, it really gets very specific about the type of land that is being conserved and the requirements around it. I know that there is a, an exception to build that because there has been a wildlife disturbance assessment that's documented saying that there can be some some mitigating factors there we can go ahead and build there but it does not address the fact that um, it's not contiguous with the other open spaces and by allowing for a development to go into that area it would not be compliant with the bylaw in 31 and 27. Okay. In regards to the erosion control plan, at pre-application it was identified that this was a high risk development based on the slopes and the DBR's recommendation was to make sure that an erosion control plan was put forth for discretionary permit. We're here and we're now being asked to move that to the uh, next step, final plans and or uh, administrative <coughs> permit. I think that now would be a good time to have that available to us because there is a phase one and a phase two of this and there appears to be a lot of unanswered questions in regards to what the impacts of this will have on the wildlife corridor, on the the issues on Butternut Road as far as erosion is concerned. Constantly, there's been issues on Butternut Road with that. So let just, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Um, I think I understood the Howards to say that they would like to defer the erosion control plan, not, not do it, but defer it because that because you don't exa know exactly where the driveways will be placed. Is that correct? Is that what I heard? So in a detailed plan mm -hmm. that you're going to approve tonight, 
it's required that we know where the driveways are going to be. We need to know where the curb cut is going to be. We need to know where the utilities are going to be. We need to know where all of these things are going to be in order to approve based on the criteria in the checklist and the bylaws. You think that the people who are going to build the house would have something to say to where they want to put them. You're developing the land. You're not, you're not selling lots. You're, 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 you're submitting a, a plan for a subdivision. So let me ask. So. Matt, you want to weigh in on that? Which part? <laughs> uh, the part about fixing the uh, about the part. Uh, Kevin's point about fixing the uh, um, fixing the point of access and the roads on the plat. Sure. At this stage. At this stage. So there there are a number of things the DRB is supposed to know about access. Um, before approving a discretionary permit. And, and the main ones are compliance with the access chapter. How long are the driveways going to be? Are they going to traverse any steep slopes? Is, is there um, an easement of adequate width that that uh, driveway is going to live on top of? And um, if it is of a certain length, uh, does, it, does it meet the requirements for the exceptions in the access chapter? You've been through this with a couple of projects. And in terms of the exact design, where it gets a little bit stickier is when you build a driveway, and if you're on a high-risk site, the way you're going to manage the runoff from that driveway is it's part of your runoff and erosion control plan. So you're, you're typically going to show um, where your ditches are going to go on the side of the driveway. You, you may show that the ditches are going to be stone lined with stone of a certain size or that you're going to have check dams every so many feet. Um, what the requirement is on a high-risk site for runoff and erosion control, this is Chapter 29, um, 29.4, and it says, you know, you, you have to submit a runoff and erosion control plan um, how you, showing how you'll meet the performance standards of Chapter 29, which are included uh, below this, prior to getting a permit. Um, what must be included, you have to be basing it on a grading plan of the site and its immediate environs, showing existing and proposed contours at intervals of no more than two feet, all information required by the erosion um, control plan checklist. Um, you don't have to do detailed contour mapping for portions of the site you're not going to disturb. Um, and then you're showing that you're meeting these standards. So you're showing that you're avoiding steep slopes in excess of 15%. You're showing that your forms are going to fit the terrain. In other words, you're not doing a massive, you know, bulldozing of the site to create something that's really not matching the slope that's there. You're showing that you're going to phase your construction. So if you have a big construction site, you're not going to go in and open the whole thing up at once and expose it all um, to generating potential runoff. You're going to do it in phases. Uh, you're going to minimize impervious surfaces. So it says the extent of paving and other impervious surfaces should be minimized by thoughtful site planning, keeping roads as narrow and as short as possible, keeping surface parking areas small. Um, marking limits of disturbance. So you actually go out um, on the site prior to construction. This is, again, DPW requesting that pre-construction meeting. And you, you flag where are we going to break into the earth and where are we going to stay away from and that gets a head nod from the Public Works Department before you go and actually start moving dirt. Um, all of those things are part of a runoff and erosion control plan. Um, I can, you know. So you're, you're telling me about the internal workings of the erosion and control plan, but how about, how about Kevin's point about uh, it being fixed at this hearing point now as opposed to uh, being performed at a later date? Okay, so what the bylaw says, when must a runoff and erosion control plan be submitted? Now remember, you noted at pre-app that one is required for yep. development on the site. Yep. All applications for permits for developments that are not exempt or defined as low risk, I'm paraphrasing, shall be accompanied by a professionally prepared runoff and erosion control plan that shows how compliance with the performance standards of 29.5 below will be attained both during construction of the proposed development and the continuing use of the site. And then we get into some of the, all the mechanics I was reading back to you, all the, all the things you have to do to make sure you're preventing runoff off the site. But what about timing? Yeah, 
it didn't, you're not, <laughs> you're not specifying, is it? I, what the bylaw says is applications for permits for developments that are not exempt shall be accompanied by this plan. So it's done so at the, at the point where they pull their permit. What I always tell people is until I issue an administrative permit and that Z sign has been up for 15 days unappealed, you don't have anything at all. Okay. So people often refer to different stages of review as my permit or the permit, and even state environmental court will do this with a discretionary permit appeal. They'll say, well, this is the permit, and it always kind of throws me for a loop because we tell people all day long, nothing happens in Williston without the issuance of that administrative permit. Okay. Kevin, does that answer your question? Uh, it does answer my question. And I understand that there's a significant expense to this, and, and, and I mean, that needs to be taken into consideration. Much like the Howards have every right to do everything they, they want in developing their land, I understand that. But making sure that we're applying all of the bylaws fairly across this subdivision is a big concern of mine. Having watched the folks in action with other similar projects and the amount of detail, especially at this point. And that's been very clear that with, with me and Jesse and, and, and the staff has been wonderful in, in, in saying this is a methodical process. It's there for a reason to make sure that we're, that we're doing this right. So we, so I, I, you know, I'm gonna, I would like to just state that we're here to allow the Howards to exercise their rights, and we're here to have you exercise yours. Yeah. Right. So I, I think the entire board and the staff recognizes that. Right. And uh, we're happy to go through. We're happy to go through point by point. You know, of, of your concerns. Um. I want you know, to make sure that they are taken into account. Thank you. I appreciate that. May I ask uh, one follow-up question, Matt? If if we did agree that at the time that they pull the permit that the erosion control plan was due at that point would kevin or any other abutters be given the opportunity to weigh in at that point or or no so once you're at the administrative permit stage um if i issue the permit the notice of my issuance of the permit is posted and there's a 15-day appeal period so the opportunity for participation is still there, but it's 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 very different from the opportunity to come to a public hearing and, and talk over something. So I, I don't want to pretend that they're the same. Um, and we often hear from people, well, gosh, I was out of town and I didn't see the Z card and I didn't realize my neighbor had a permit for anything at all. And I'm you know I'm really surprised at what they ended up doing. Um, so as you're thinking about what level of process you as a board want to require i think it's worth informing that with understanding that you know saying you know what i really want to see that runoff and erosion control plan you know complementing the driveway design before we sign final plans because you know somebody on this board is going to have to come in and and write their signature on on a plat for this subdivision uh, in, in consideration of it and all the supporting materials that come in. And if, if it's saying we trust the process and the staff to require an adequate runoff and erosion control plan and administrative permit, that's, that's fine. If this board said, you know, I, we, we, we know it says at the time of the permit, we want it sooner because we want to make sure that it's fully discussed and aired and, and that we can so if I see that plan and I think I'm not so sure I agree with it and I need to then decide to retain um, professional help to look at that plan, that's all kind of on me to decide. Um, sometimes with a fairly excited uh, would-be house builder sort of calling me every 20 minutes, why am I gonna get my permit? Um, so, you know, th there's a lot of this for the board to think about that's just about like, how does this process work uh, when do you have more public participation? When do you have less public participation? Um, tonight, there's, there's five heads in the room and, and three staff members talking about this, um, but at some point it might be me. You know, in the end, it's me looking at a permit application. How much you say, no, I wanna see that, I want that to be part of the signed off final plans is, is really up to the board to decide.
Mm -hmm. One question, is there a possibility that the guys would come out to do the plan and suddenly say, you can't do it? Can't do... Can't build the driveway on that. Can't build the driveway without, without, you know, without, you know, literally, you know, huge expense. Right. So, so, so the risk associated with varying levels of design that the board requires is somebody can say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to design that until I get to uh, administrative permit. And then they come to do it and they say, you know, that thing the DRB approved, there's no way I can meet those conditions. There's no way I can do it the way they approved it. And they look at me and say, you, you got to let me change this. And I have a set of criteria in, in my bylaw about how much administratively I'm allowed to let somebody change something um, from what the DRB approved. And, and my ability to allow change is really small. Um, the bylaw talks about moving you know, the ramp on a sidewalk a few feet, that kind of thing is very, very small. So um, we often have conversations with applicants when they come in and they want to change something and we say, you know, that's coming, that's going to go back to the board. So in this case, um, you know, if you, if you can't submit a runoff and erosion control plan that meets all of those interests of 29.5, you know, which talks about like, don't create big contours, follow the terrain, uh, slow down runoff. You say, you know, I can't do all that. That's really expensive. Well, my answer as administrator is going to be, well, you, you can file for an amendment with the DRB and have them review it um, because I'm out of my allowed flexibility under the bylaw. You have a proposed condition that relates to the runoff and erosion control plan. I don't think we do. So one way or the other, we need to add a condition either, but it can happen. It needs to happen. Yeah, let me look and see. There may be a boilerplate one. Um, well, it's mentioned on page seven. points on the erosion control. Okay, great. Um, Matt, on, on page six, also about utilities in the staff notes. Yeah, yeah, it's page, page, six, page six, utilities, site plan does not. Yeah, I think that the erosion control plan and the, the driveway and the utilities really go hand in hand when we're going to be talking about how this is going to be developed. A proposed driveway doesn't make sense to put it in one area and then put in a proposed corridor to put in your underground utilities in another area. It's my understanding that the site plan has to provide that information. Gary, do you, at your, this stage, a detailed site plan. Is, Gary, is your plan for the utilities to follow the driveways? Yes. Okay. Matt, does the bylaw require a utility plan? So the, the requirement to show utilities comes from the administrator adopted checklists uh, that we use when we take in discretionary permit applications. And those are universal checklists with varying degrees of applicability depending on um, what kind of project is proposed. So, you know, we use the same discretionary permit checklist for, um, you know, a 60 room hotel at Finney Crossing as we do for a, a five lot residential subdivision in rural Williston. The other issue is that what exact utilities? We're only talking about 
electric and gas, right? The no gas, gas. The gas, gas. ever, gas. Did gas ever go down, butternut? No, no, gas. Gas. <laughs> no cable. No cable. <laughs> no gas. <laughs> so it's electric only. Well, yeah. It's electric. It's probably, probably communication and electrical. And um, I will say that the board's general practice um, other than noting the requirement that utilities be underground because we do have home builders who come in and uh, want to save money by being overhead and Williston has prohibited that for some time. Um, the utilities, the, the things I would characterize as utilities that in its, in its time that I've been with them, the board has required more detail on have been, um, especially when somebody was going a very long distance with their water supply or wastewater. Uh, we, we've had some people who had to do a horizontal bore under a stream to go from their house to their septic system, uh, sometimes even a partial force main. So, you know, as much as the board doesn't involve itself in wastewater system design, water supply design, there are times when those get complicated enough, the board says we, we really want to see more about those. Um, the, the specification for burying electrical and communication is typically, you know, it's it's in a trench. It's usually in the driveway. I will say we have had a couple of residential subdivisions where the utilities didn't run in the driveway because the driveway needed to go back and forth up a slope, and the utilities were able to go straight. Um, it, it, it happens either way. The, I, th I think the bylaw requirement around electrical and overhead utilities has been to get them in the ground primarily for aesthetic reasons. And if a buyer or a, um, a new owner wanted to move the driveway in order to accommodate putting their utilities in because the driveway is not coming in from where the utilities are across the street currently on this site plan, what would that process be? Can they come in and change this approved site plan? So in reading this subdivision plat, which is, you know, for the, for the most part, we have we have a plat here. It, it, it's really not a site plan in the sense of everything we would get, you know, if so, again, if somebody was doing a more urban development. This shows an easement 65 feet wide. It shows a driveway meeting the town's driveway width requirement somewhere in those 65 feet. If somebody came in and said, well, it's going to be inside that 65 foot easement, you know, more or less, or rather, it's going to be in that easement somewhere where it needs to be. I can't move the easement and I wouldn't want to approve a plan where somebody was building a driveway over someone else's land and, and not in the easement because I would be signing off on something that they didn't really have a legal right to. Um, I will say, you know, when you look at a plan like this outside of that 65 foot easement, when you get onto each of the subject parcels and there's a driveway drawn in, do driveways get built exactly like they are on subdivision flats? No, they don't. People always, they run into constraints, they run into grade challenges, they decide they want to turn around. Um, it's, it's messier than that. And, and we do get some variance uh, once people get onto their properties. But if somebody came in and said, I really need to be somewhere else than where my easement is, you're, you're, you're coming back here to amend the subdivision plat to adjust that easement. Um, well, the other thing is these aren't really uh, drive, you know, plain old driveways per se because they have to support a fire engine. You know, this is not like, you know, the normal development where you come, the fire engine comes down, you know, the, the main street and they can string hose from there up to where, wherever the house is. Some of these houses are in far enough that the driveway has got to basically support a, a large vehicle. Yeah, so our driveway standard is 12 feet wide, four feet clear on either side of that. So essentially a 20 foot wide cleared area with a 12 foot wide hardened surface in the middle of it. Um, and what we often get for fire department comments, and, and we often solicit comments in rural projects is, once we get that house plan is, is this turnaround gonna be okay for you guys? If, if you have to go up here, are you gonna be able to get back out? Yeah. Um, and we've done that uh, across the road on Shag Bark Lane with a, with a unit um, and, and in other places in town. But it's, I would say more often than not, once somebody gets building that driveway and, and grading out that home site, they start to want to shift things a little bit because they, you know, they run into a big boulder. They, um, something changes a little bit, and um, that does happen. Okay. Uh, 
Chapter 3 landscaping, ample buffers, typically 50 foot, Matt, as you indicated. Yes. It's something that's been um, discussed and implemented in other subdivisions, and a 50 foot buffer around the entire subdivision um, is something that I'd like to see happen. Do you have, so your, your house is tucked in the corner. The proposed, the proposed building envelope for lot one is south west of you. And it's approximately how much, uh, what the distance from your, it's pretty good. The distance. So, yeah, it almost appears as though there, how much clearing is going to be done in connection with? So 250 feet behind you. Based on 200 meters. I'd say it's about 150, 200 feet from, from my property line. Yeah, my house from, is, from, from your property right, from, yeah, okay, okay, from, from the property line. Yeah. Um, the wastewater is going to be 50 feet away from the, the, the leach field is going to be 50 feet away from my property. property line. And the proposed driveway will, people will turn, drive up Butternut and they will turn onto this proposed driveway and be facing my living room. A 50 foot buffer is yeah. not gonna do much, but it's gonna be something. A 50 foot buffer, if we don't have this be compliant with 27 and 31 in regards to open space, a 50 foot buffer will at least give the habitat corridor and the wildlife um, are you talking about the 50 foot buffer between the driveway and your the incoming driveway off of butternut and your property line is the right of way on your property there is a right of way on my property but it's not being proposed being used right. the the right of way is being proposed or the driveway is being proposed coming nice. in just north of my so there's a little pie there. That's where the driveway is going to come in. I'm touched by this development on three sides. One will be a driveway. The other two will be uh, a house and a leach field. Yeah. Your, does your driveway, will your driveway parallel the, the new driveway? My driveway? Yeah. My driveway kind of goes up diagonally and... Okay. Is, is the right of way that it's on your property? Is that Mr. Howard's right of way too? Or is it? it is. He has a right of way on my property. I have a right of way on his property for my driveway. It's a mess. <laughs> Good. Uh, would the 50, if let's say we were to impose a 50 foot buffer requirement, wouldn't that impact the proposed septic field on lot one? Probably. Are there, are there, certain restrictions on placement of anything within a certain radiuses from the septic field? So um, I'll, I'll, I'll flip it around and say when you impose a setback to a property line, um, the zoning district is going to list what can you do in that setback. It's generally very limited. Um, and I'll tell you what it says. So in the ag rural district, once you have a setback, you can, must it be set back from property lines? Um, let's see, where do we do it? What uses are permitted in required setbacks? Required setbacks must be landscaped as type one, three or four buffer. Access drives, roads, pedestrian ways, underground utility lines, and where such lines are permitted overhead utility lines may cross required setbacks at a right angle plus or minus 10 degrees. Pedestrian ways may also run parallel to and within a required setback. Parking and loading areas may not be placed within required setbacks. So what I would say is if the board wanted to require a 50 foot setback to be provided on the subject parcel, uh, more or less in the location where that 65 foot wide driveway easement is um, along the north edge of the Mazuzan's property. If you were to require that to be 50 feet wide, I would recommend you also require 
a shifting of the driveway easement and driveway so that it's not in conflict with that setback. Because you can't run in the setback. You can run across it if you need to. Um, so if you want to require a buffer there, it, it would necessitate moving that driveway, um, move the easement 50 okay, feet. Okay, so... Um, you said that you have a you have a right of way on the Howard's property, and you have a right of way on his property. It's the same. It's the same. It's so part of it's on yours, and part of it. It's all on his. It's all on his. But you're but you're proposing the driveway the the driveway right away on your property. Yes. Okay. Okay. Fine. I get. All right. Okay. Fine. Um, you don't. You don't have a right of way on the Howard's property. No, I, I, I do. I have a, a little right of way. Oh, yes, yes. To the end, 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 end. Yes. Okay, so you, you're way up by the. Yes. You're way up by the corner yeah, of Butterman. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fine. Yep, he does. He does. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. right. I get right it. There. Mm -hmm. right I get there. it. Yeah, it's right. Try there. and explain that one. <laughs> Two different people on the land. Yeah. 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 Oh. I've read your letter. I just have a quick question. What, what, what's your what's your objective? You, I, I think my sense from hearing from you at this meeting and prior meetings is that you don't object to the development, but that you would love to see that it be very thoughtful. And I, I just I wonder, is it are you do you object to the placement of that building envelope on lot one? And do you have a have you explored alternatives that might satisfy you in terms of with Mr. Howard or Mr. and Mrs. Howard? I, I, I thank you, Jill, for, for asking the question. Jesse and I discussed this at length a lot. And we've come up with, with, with some very achievable goals. Number one, the success for Mr. and Mrs. Howard to achieve their goal of paying their back, selling this land to pay their back taxes. They've been very consistent from the get-go. That can be resolved. We can, we can protect the, the core habitat, and we can protect the wildlife corridor. We can also not disrupt the entire um, slope up there by thoughtfully approaching this. And we actually came up with another plan. Um, that took into consideration all of those goals being achieved. Mr. I, Howard's wants and the town's requirements. Can you say that again? Mr. Howard's want, it achieves both what uh, Mr. and Mrs. Howard want and what the town requires by shifting a couple lines around. Right by the Howard. No. Do you have, I did hear, do you, do you have a plan? Graphically, that you can share with us. Why don't you ask? I, I did hear Matt in the very beginning of this saying that I had somewhere around the land to build thirty homes. Thirty-nine. Did he said. say thirty-nine? He said 39. thirty-nine. I'd like to build. I don't want to build them. I'd like to sell the property for two. I've lived here a long time. I understand deer habitat. I understand slope. I understand sewage. I've been doing this. I am more than willing to do whatever I have to do. But starting over now, redrawing lines for the benefit of one person's view is more than I think I want to do. I'm to the point of saying to somebody, here, build 30 houses. And I'll move. So we're here, we are here. To keep me from doing that. No, no. <laughs> no, I understand. No, I, so I, no, I understand, no, Scott, and I know, I know exactly what you're doing. No, we're actually, the re no, we're here, no, believe it or not, we're not here to do that. Okay. Because if somebody came in here and 
um, proposed 39.5 homes, we wouldn't do that, but we would certainly listen to 39. And, um, and yeah. we would be, we would, we would have to, because that would be that person's right. They could propose 39 homes based on his math. Um, and I mean, we would be having the same conversation with, with Kevin, but that, but that proposal would get a fair hearing. And so what, but what's going on right now is you're getting a fair hearing and, I understand. and there is a, and there is a, you know, there's a, another party in the room that has points to make, um, and concerns. And so they're getting a fair hearing mm -hmm. and these hearings can be frustrating for the applicant, for uh, the abutters, um, for the board members. Uh, but you know, this is kind of what we sign on to, and this is what you get to sign on to when you know when you open yourself, when you open yourself up to this type of scrutiny. Um, so I would argue, or I would console you. <laughs> don't get frustrated. I, I so let, let the board let the board listen. Yeah. To I am sorry. I, no, I, it's been a long. Don't be sorry. And long, perhaps long. what we may hear, we don't know what we're going to hear, but perhaps it doesn't involve redrawing the lines. Perhaps it involves them giving you a right of way over their land and put a house somewhere else on lot one. I, I don't know. I don't know. So let us let's 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 work through the points. Okay. And uh, um, that's why Susan's sitting here. She's black and bluing my leg. Uh, she's, watched she's, her kick you. she's 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 you've, you've watched her kick me. I know you have. Uh, that's that's why she's okay. sitting up here with me, sir. So I think I'd like to see the plan. Don't get frustrated. You can get one to the camera crew, that would be great. Okay, so we're not moving the house. Thank you. Or we are moving the house. This is Kevin's house, right here. This was the old lot one, and this is lot two. And now they've made that lot one long and narrow. So one of the things that Jesse and I did was we drew the orange line as the driveway. That orange line is directly across the street from where the buried utilities are already located. That's also the area that's already wide open because it's where the logging took place. And it's uh, far enough away from the corner that it will allow for a curb cut to be put on the road and meet all requirements um, that the town is going to require in regards to safety concerns. So sight lines. Sight lines, yes. Okay. The, uh, the visual triangle. Um, it doesn't move the lot one building envelope. It does move the lot, or excuse me, lot two. It does move the lot one building envelope. Um, it allows for um, the utilities and the road to all be in one area. It also took into consideration the disaster, or excuse me, I worked for the right boss. <laughs> uh, it takes into consideration the uh, wildlife uh, disturbance by locating those two parcels in a way that it will be less of an impact on the corridor and the habitat. It allows for access to lot five on that same driveway to not have to run through uh, lot three, the open space. Right. Yes, so it's not going through lot um, three, the open space. Um, it still allows lot five to have ample open space around it. And that is also compliant with 27 and 31 as far as contiguity with additional 
open space, which again, really protects that unfragmented forest, which is quite unique to that area. Now, if you if you were to look at your orange line, you put is that down the crest of the hill, ways? Yeah. Uh, for, what are you proposing for their driveway? Is that that isn't on a level road, is it there? So there's so where that orange is, there is an existing woods road or farm road, road yeah. that the logger's been using. Um, we also tried to make sure that we kept the uh, the wastewater system on lot one and two in lot one and two. Any comment here? Yeah, a couple. One of the reasons the driveway was where it was is so that we don't take off a third of lot two's property to service two other building sites. We kept it close to the boundary line. We kept it close to the border. Um, so we didn't cut off a third of his lot. Lot two gets bigger. They're both the same. It just kind of reconfigures it. It just changes this, you know, the angles. Um, the other thing is the driveway then runs right through the middle of lot one. Right through the middle. Could you run it down, could you run it down the property line between the one and two? Nope. It's over the hill. You notice this topo map. I mean, there's some existing woods roads there, and there's some additional paths now um, from the skitter. So. I mean, we just drew a line just to, right. to right. I mean, this is not, this is a, con a conceptual plan. It's conceptual, and, 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 and Gary, if this were lot one, this whole thing, it would, it would go along the property line here and then come right out to this parcel. But what I'm saying is, is it, well, this is part of lot one? Yeah, this is all lot one. Okay, missed that. This is all lot one. Then it goes, so goes down the boundary line. Right along the property line. Oh, I know it is. I know it is, Kevin. I've got no problem with that. I just wonder who's going to pay for this. You and I can have that conversation. Yeah. So if you consider this, then we'll talk. <clears throat> Susan, we'll talk about well, it. Well, see, that's, that's my, we're, we're, that's my five issue. Thousand, five you know, thousand I'm just thousands just of dollars <laughs> in <laughs> already, and I, I can't turn around now and Listen, pay and another 4000 for the septic systems and the designs. I'm just too far in, Kevin. And, 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 and we wouldn't have to because the septic process. system can still is this the it can still That one will be acceptable. How about this one down here? Does this cut into it? No, because it's right there. The deer okay. So that's still doable. And in regards to actually meeting with the man that's going to do this for you? But what I see, I've always, I, got, I have a contract on this, Kevin. I think that if you propose this to the, to, and we know that as soon as that went, out of contract, it went right back into. Yeah, I did. I, I, I don't, so, but I don't know how I'm going to deal with that. I got, do you hear? Can I just refuse? I, I mean, I, I can. We'll work on. Okay. Okay. I, you know, Kevin, I stay here. Don't go away. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem with that. I have no problem. My issue is, I have. I want to, I'm trying to get out of this. I have pieces, you know, that say July, Kevin, I want to get this done. I mean, I, I can't. I mean, it's, 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 it's going to be up to the board. Yeah. It's not really. I know. I, I, I you know, don't. I brought up, Gary brought up some concerns. Yeah. I think they're valid concerns, and this is going to achieve all of these goals. It will. It will. I mean. Yeah. And I, I get you know I laugh. I, you, you know I laugh at the habitat thing. You know that. You know that as well as I do. Well, we know. But <laughs> sorry. Your turn. <laughs> no, actually, what I, what do you, uh, what do you say about ten thousand dollars? What do you know. say about what do, what do you say about us, you know, recessing this for two weeks and letting you two, letting you two you got it. talk this out? I would do that. I, again, I, like I told Kevin. 
I owe the town $100,000. It goes up every month by 1.8%. So any time that I spend going back and forth, okay, that's where I am. That's where I am. I, I have no vested. Our, our family yeah, land I have no vested interest in where, taxes. <laughs> as long as I can do it well. I, 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 and, I can okay. Williston so, didn't want to barter the land. What's that? Williston didn't want the land. <laughs> no, no, I tried. They don't. They don't. Right. Vermont Land Trust doesn't want it. They don't want it, even though it's hooked up to um, other. You know, they the didn't other. want it. Well, they don't it make money. They just spend it all. It on wasn't the pretty enough. Is what Miss <laughs> Andrioletti told me. But that's beside so, the point. Two weeks. Who's the gentleman in the back? That's my realtor, Nick. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm curious. He's harmless. Uh, he's a nice man. I, I was I was more curious if that was if that was your if that was your engineer. But no, um, it's not. Do you have other points you would like to make about this 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 hearing? No. Are you amenable to, not that you have any really say in this, but are you amenable to us continuing this for two weeks so that you have time to talk with the Howards to see if this has some um, value to them? And if it does, then come back in front of the board. And if you do work out a deal, will you drop your um, uh, issues? I guess they're wrong. That's the wrong word. They would be gone. Yeah. Your concern. Yeah, they would be gone. Yes. Okay. All right. More than happy okay. To meet with that. Matt, do you see anything anything wrong with what I'm proposing here? So the only thing uh, for the oh, board to consider is the logistics of two weeks is a tight turnaround. So maybe four. Um, well, it's, and it's killing him. Yeah, I know. Well, that's the thing. Is I, but, I do think that it's there's a I don't know that may be unfair to the applicant as well to be asked to redesign. So what I would what that I would, would be, say that would be something that that sorry Matt oh no go ahead that, that that would be something that at least from my perspective that the the two parties would have to work out in terms of perhaps they, they and, share the cost of engineering they, they would have what to have you. they would have to work that out where does it put me in this process okay so we're in the discretionary permit process if you continue for two weeks you're still in the discretionary permit process the close of that process should there be an approval is an authorization to file final plans which you get once the minutes from whatever meeting it's approved at um, get approved so if we come may back I, I, make, I would like to make one point and that is that if say let's say this is continued for two weeks and you are unable to reach an agreement between the two of you you still have a hearing and you still have um, your submission in front of the board. Correct. So you're not waiving. You're not waiving any rights. You are you are delaying it by two weeks, but you're not waiving any any rights based on the submission that we are sitting here ready to deliberate on now. Other okay. than this may have value to the both of you, that that maybe the two of you can work out your differences. Just Please. for one point of clarification as well is if they let's say they are able to work it out and and we see something similar to this revised plan does that need to go back for any prior review or can we not necessarily so um, we you know as a staff what we would do is we would be willing to take a look at anything that you know collectively you folks come up with over the next say week and a half um, and call out any issues. So, for example, what's shown here that um, Kevin Mazuzan submitted to the board tonight appears at first glance under the rules of the town to be another approvable way um, that, um, you know, as you've discussed, limits the, um, you know, addresses the contiguity of open space issue and, and then does some other things. So we can kind of do that. We can look at a plan. What I would say to the board is, you know, what is the board's comfort level if you saw something at, you know, about this level of detail and said, okay, we're going to authorize you to file a final plan that, that does this, because that's the next step. So when so a final I think, the, I think, the, I think uh, my position as an individual board member, but also as the chair, would be um, 
I'm going to kick it right back at you and go, if the, st if the staff believes that it does check all the boxes necessary, then I think the staff should say that. And then if it does not, you need to say that too. Um, yeah. And then the board can take it from there. Yeah. So, so to pass some kind of... The board, I'm speaking for all of you, so feel free to weigh in. Well, the, the way I look at it is what has been presented here as an alternative plan does not really uh, deviate in terms of level of detail dramatically from doesn't, what was submitted as, as the application. So I just, you know, I'll just throw that out there that I, I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing a barrier okay. in the only what was submitted. The only concern I would have would be um, Bruce's concern about the entrance to the driveway in that location from the town. In which location? In the proposed, in, um, in the Kevin's proposed, proposed location. George location, right? Mm -hmm. yes. It's quite a ways down from the corner. I mean, the, the other one was up on the corner, but you still had the, Yeah. It, it, you know, there's a couple hundred feet in both directions, that's this, all. This puts it at least so that the sight lines both. You got, you got, you actually got better. You got better sight lines. West. Got better sight lines. It, yeah. also, it also takes into consideration Susan Elliott across the street, because she had a concern about where the driveway would be. And yep. She's well aware of this, um, because we actually spoke to. He's not here, so let's not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I spoke to, I spoke to, to Bruce okay. about. Provided Bruce is not on vacation next week, which I very much doubt, um, we can we can wave something in front of Bruce. I, as a staff, we we would need to see something, um, say by the end of the day, Wednesday or Thursday next week. What do you want to see? An engineer so, so report of new lines? Nope. I think a sketch at this level of if if there's a a compromise or an agreed upon way forward, some drawing that reflects that that this board can understand and that they could look at and say we're going to act on this revised submission and say yep go tell your surveyor to put this one on mylar make this the subdivision plan that's what we have to do so okay. if if it's i mean tell me if i'm wrong board but if, if you saw something about like this to me i could tell you you could say yeah go turn that into a final plan yep that's yep. the next step. Definitely. I agree. Um, so we're not talking about necessarily, uh, you know, it's reasonably to scale, reflects the clearances, the setbacks, the general layout of those lot lines, and the board says, you know, after some discussion and conditions, yeah, go ahead and file a final plan based on that. So I would, I would reiterate that I think the two of you, both parties should sit down and push and pull based on you know, based on where you, you know, you feel you need the road or you feel you need the boundary line or you, what have you, and then see if you can come to an agreement. If you can come to an agreement, get your surveyor or your engineer. He's going to the only He other doesn't question, even no. answer our phone calls anymore. <laughs> I don't. The only other question I've got is the markings for the wells. Has, uh, has, a, has a driller been out there? No. Or are those just, so those are just... Imaginary well, places. The guy the, did the, the yes, chest. The, yes. Yeah. Mr. Quackenbush walked around, but he didn't make any assessment. He, just, he says okay, he so just you tests soil. You haven't had one of the well companies no. come out. Okay. No. I was going to say, they may come out and suddenly say, your wellhead's going to be someplace completely different. I know. The only other thing I would note is that when you had the wetlands delineated, they delineated lots one and two as originally proposed so there are some right so some of some of the open space lot on lot three right has been absorbed by this it's and even higher and drier it's higher and drier so yeah it goes up the cliff it, issue, but it works up the, yeah, it I know goes, I know that's a good point yeah but you, you I think you're right to point out that the board would want confirmation that some kind of confirmation any change to this wasn't going to do that so you know we can show you what the state map says about where the, it thinks wetlands are on the site we know that understates their extent but also informed by topography and however else you want to do it or you ask for another piece of information to show up with that final plan set that just confirms it yeah. um, okay. all right are we in agreement we know what about the conservation commission. Yeah, I've talked to Kevin. 
<laughs> yeah, but do we need to talk to who are the other people? Do we have to talk to a wetland? No, 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 no. Come by the office. Call Emily tomorrow. Is that? Just come by the office tomorrow. We'll, so, we'll, we'll go through everything. I was going next, to. <laughs> yeah, I do on my list. Next hearing is the, the 25th correct, yes. of June. The staff will need this to them by next Wednesday. If you so, want it in paper form in the mail to you, we need it by Wednesday. If you're comfortable getting, you know, one image electronically, what does it, you guys have Friday. A, Friday. You guys I am comfortable with getting an electronic image on and Friday. And you can have something for us. And have at something the printed at the hearing. Yeah. So you, then that would be Thursday. Yeah. You, you're not going to get a big revised write-up of whatever we get. You're, but you're it would might it would nice it would be nice to get just a quick a quick synopsis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so next Wednesday, if we uh, next Thursday, we'll just keep these. Okay. Yeah, we'll keep people your packet. So the hearing. <laughs> okay. So we are going to, based on this discussion, you're not getting anything writing in writing from the board. We are here. We are going to continue this um, hearing until the 25th, uh, at which time we will. We would expect to see you both back here again. All right. If uh, if you. I if I could just add, um, this was a great process. This is the Vermont way. So kudos to both of you, to all of you. I agree. I agree. I think we didn't go out behind the woodshed. However, you waited a little long. I probably hard, but where I grew up. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Next okay. time, next time, come forward sooner. <laughs> no, it's fine. Ooh, it's okay. No, damn. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, he's yeah. Thank you. 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 Okay. Um, the uh, Williston Devel Development Review Board is out of deliber uh, deliberation at 9:04 uh, for Tuesday, June 11th. Um, uh, do I have a motion for HP 19-03 slash AP 19-0214, Andrew and Angela Conforti? Yes. As authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, David Turner, moved the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town's staff and advisory boards, required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of June 11, 2019, accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law proposed by the staff and approve HP 1903 for proposed door to window conversion. This approval authorizes the applicant to seek administrative permit for the proposed development, which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based. We will be adding one condition. Um, the condition is the applicant has the discretion to use one of the three color options proposed to the DRB. Great, That's it. thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Any further, do, do I have a second? I'll second it. Pete seconds it, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Five ayes, no nays, motion carries. Uh, DP 19-09, uh, Gary Howard has been continued to the next hearing of June 25th. I have a motion to approve the minutes of May 28th. Point. Was I here or was I not here? Yeah, there's corrections that have to be made. <laughs> you were not here. <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> since, it, since, it, since it says I'm both present and absent. So, so, uh, so what, Brad, why don't you walk us through the proposed amendments to the minutes? Sure. So the minutes should read that... I wasn't here last week. My understanding is that Mr. Kelly, Mr. Riley, and Mr. Christensen were not present for the hearing. I believe that's correct. That's correct. And then so also Mr. Christensen's name should not be, should be posted where it's not present and removed from. Mm -hmm. Is that your only, are those the, your only proposed changes? Um, yes, all that came to my attention. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as Amended by Brad. I'll second it. Jill seconds it. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Five ayes, no nays. We'd like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting at 9.06. So moved. So moved.